So I've been at Chalk for about seven years now, and when I came to the county, there really actually wasn't a very good concussion program anywhere for, for pediatrics specifically, and especially for, especially for the kids that were really young. So some of the adult providers will care for our teenagers, um, but being an elementary school, really nobody in the county was taking care of kids um, from the youngest ages, um, even to like around 10, 12 years old. That's where the adult providers get really, really uncomfortable. Um, and, and in many ways, you guys all know, and hopefully you know, but kids are not little adults, right? Their physiology is very different. Their brain development is very, very different. And so having pediatric subspecialists and pediatric experts to care for these kind of complex conditions is really, really important. So I'm very fortunate to be part of a fantastic neuroscience institute at Chalk Children's. Um, we're one of the only level four epilepsy centers, um, one of a handful of epilepsy centers in the, in the United States that treats really complicated seizure disorders, for example. Um, again, we have the multidisciplinary concussion clinic. We have a muscular dystrophy clinic. Um, some really, really exciting things. And, and one of our principles is really working with other providers in multidisciplinary ways. Um, so instead of just seeing one provider uh, for, for a complicated disorder, you actually get to see multiple people so that we can give you the best care possible. Um, so we work with sports medicine. I work with neuropsychologists in the concussion clinic. Um, we have a dedicated uh, sports rehabilitation team or concussion rehabilitation team as well. Um, so we do a lot, of, uh, a lot of things in those spaces. So if you think about concussions, there's a lot of media out there, right? So these are those parking lot talks that you guys have and, you know, what did Dr. Oz say about it? What did Oprah say about it? Um, what did you know, the LA Times say about it or the OC Register say about it? And so sometimes that can kind of be a little bit confusing about what is real and what is not real. And the same time as this media frenzy is happening, there's actually a lot of literature that's being developed and put out there in the medical literature. And actually as a clinician, it's also hard to sort of decipher that because many times there's one article that says this and one article that says that and they kind of disagree with each other. So uh, deciphering that and then relaying it back to parents and back to the media is, is also really, really important. So maybe if it'll go, oh, there we go. Okay, so based on both the literature and the media, there's a number of laws in California that both educators and parents should be aware of. Um, some of the, the, the more important ones and the ones that I really, really find helpful is making sure that we have good concussion education for coaches, teachers, um, individuals that care for our children. If they don't understand how to recognize a concussion and what to do when you get a concussion, um, obviously that puts your child at risk. And so there's an incident where I had to speak with one of the coaches, and the coach told me, well, what's the big deal? We used to hit our heads on balls you know, that were as hard as rocks. It's just a concussion. Um, and on the flip side of that, I've had first concussion, recovered very, very nicely, um, but the coach was like, or the, actually a physician told this patient, you should never play any sports again, you're done. And, and so really those extremes don't make a lot of sense to me. Um, what we're trying to do is, is make sure we're educating people, understanding what the risks are, understanding the benefits of sports because there are many benefits to sports, but then making sure that we have good provisions in place to try and protect our kids when they're playing those sports. Other laws that came out and recommendations include limited contact practices and limits on times before you can return to play. So if you had a concussion, how quickly you can actually get back into the sport. Um, and the reason that those exist is because there's maybe some scary things that we need to talk about. So what is a concussion? That's the hard thing, right? So sometimes it's not so obvious because a lot of times people think about concussion, they're like, oh, you have to lose consciousness. Well, actually you don't. Um, most concussions don't lose consciousness. If you lose consciousness, it's very clear that it's a concussion, but the majority of concussions actually have no loss of consciousness. In fact, one of the best predictors of how severe a concussion is is actually something called anterior grade amnesia. So what that means is if I sustain a hit right now and I can't really remember what happened right before the hit, that doesn't bother me too much because you've temporarily disrupted this, the laying down of the memories. But if I can't remember what happens after the hit, so I took a hit and then I was confused, I don't remember the game I was playing, I don't remember going to school that day, I don't remember going to the hospital, that's actually much more predictive of the severity of the injury than actually loss of consciousness. So the way that the, the, the concussions work is there is a force that is transmitted to the brain. 
And parents are like, well, just wear a helmet, you'll be fine. Not really. So wearing a helmet is great for pr protecting yourself from a skull fracture, and that's why they came out for things like football, skiing, hockey, et cetera. Um, the helmet actually protects against skull fractures, but it has no protection actually for a concussion. There's a lot of marketing out there that you should buy this really, really fancy, you know, Mercedes Benz or whatever of the helmets, um, or Rolls Royce of the, the helmets, but in reality, the evidence behind those helmets actually protecting for concussion is not very good. So what we find is concussions can, cannot be protected from helmets. You should still wear a helmet, so I'm not saying don't wear helmets. Your kids should wear helmets. I yell at all the kids on my street. They know if they see Dr. Terriman, they better put their helmet on if they're riding their bikes. Um, they're scared of me. It's great. I love it. Um, but, but they have to wear the helmet because we don't want to have a skull fracture because you don't want a more severe head injury. Um, but it doesn't really protect you against concussions. So the concussion is a force that gets transmitted on the brain, and the brain kind of sits in this um, solution called cerebral spinal fluid. It's kind of like a water cushion, and it acts like a shock absorber. But if you, if you whip your head around enough, right, um, the, the head will actually, the brain will actually bang inside of the skull, and you can get dysfunction of the brain. You don't typically cause permanent damage, even with really bad football injuries, for example. Um, the reason that you lose consciousness, as you can see on there, there's a green area that's pointed out in the midbrain. That's where the, the consciousness receptors are, and so you have this like fulcrum point. So you have these two big hemispheres, they come down to a point, and if you shake that around, all the energy kind of goes to that point. So that's why you can lose consciousness. But the other sides are the sides of the brain. That's where your memories are actually generated. So if you think about it too, a lot of the force is on the periphery of the brain when it's spinning or moving. But you need a, a rotational force to cause a concussion. So if you're driving really, really fast and you're going straight and you slam on the brakes, you might get a whiplash injury, but you're probably not gonna get a concussion unless there's some kind of spin or rotation on the actual force. So structurally, you don't get damage typically with a concussion. What you get is you get chemical changes that happen. So your brain has many, many chemicals, and those chemicals help the brain generate electrical signals, which make you who you are. That's how you communicate, that's how you process information. It's all electrical activity. Um, so basically, I'm a fancy electrician. Um, but what happens with a concussion is those get disrupted, and back in like 97, uh, there was this thing called the Cantu rules, and it just you had a concussion, you were out for two weeks, and you go back, and it didn't matter, and it was based on this physiology. But what happens is, is that everybody actually recovers at a different rate, right? So the general rule of thumb is it takes about two weeks for everything kind of to go back to normal, but in some people it may take six days, in some people it may only take a day, in some people that it may take longer, it may double, right? So there's this range. If you have a more severe injury, then you can get these gray bars where you actually can get some cell loss and you can get some axonal injury, which are these long tracks from the neurons. But these are more like car accident type situations that I see where we actually get some real uh, permanent brain injury. Um, and I'll put a little asterisk on it. The great thing about pediatrics is the brain is developing and it has this thing called neuroplasticity. So uh, it can kind of be remired or remodified if you give it the right stimuli. So as parents, right, you want your child to be really, really good at something. What do they have to do? They have to practice it. So I use the example of a guitar, for example. If you want to learn how to play guitar, you have to practice. You're not going to just pick up the guitar and start playing guitar. So in the same way, if there was a brain injury, if there is a brain dysfunction, what you need to do is you need to give the brain alternative pathways to kind of work around whatever the issue may be. And we find that in a lot of different things. I was actually talking to um, Ali about uh, something called transmagnetic stimulation. So this is a research device that we're actually hoping to get over at Chalk. It costs about a quarter of a million dollars. But what it may allow us to do is actually change the way the brain is uh, creating pathways. So for example, we have a big mental health initiative that's happening, right? So there's actually no beds. If your child's 10 years old, becomes acutely depressed, acutely suicidal, you're gonna probably spend a couple of days in the ER and then someone's gonna ship that patient off, your daughter, your son, out of county and to a inpatient psych facility unit and you're probably gonna have a really hard time seeing your child. 
Um, so we're, we're opening up a mental health facility within Chalk to help treat some of these mental health disorders. But if you think about what a mental health disorder is, it is a neurologic disorder that we just don't fully understand yet. And so there's really good research that looks at how brain connections form. And so there are patients who are suicidal, they actually form connections. So the more they think in a depressed state and the more that they think about suicide, the stronger this dorsal uh, lateral prefrontal cortex pathway becomes ingrained. And so there's emerging research that says, you know what, I can actually tr send signals with a magnet to disrupt that neuronal pathway, or I can send signals with a magnet to strengthen certain pathways. And so rather than potentially having the patient admitted and spend weeks in an uh, inpatient psych unit and put on a number of medications, maybe I can do this much less invasive, much less long-term side effect potential type treatment for a patient, obviously in a research type setting, but maybe we can do these types of things. So, so learning how the brain works and learning how to actually alter these is, is extremely important for us as neurologists and as uh, providers who, who work in this space. So I just told you don't worry too much about concussion, but now I gotta tell you worry about concussion. So the biggest things that you gotta worry about is Two, one is something called second impact syndrome. So unfortunately, about one patient every year in the state of California gets into trouble. And what happens is, is they're, they're, they get a concussion, they either don't recognize it, they don't tell their parents, the parents don't realize it was a concussion, and then what happens is they sustain a second hit. It's typically in the same game or shortly a few days afterwards, but it's known to happen up to about a week or two after the initial concussion. And so there's this, again, this temporary dysfunction that happens in the brain. But then if you add insult to injury, there is a sudden expansion or sudden swelling of the brain that can occur and that it can lead to death or disability. And so sometimes if I have athletes and they don't really listen, what I'll do is I'll bring up these pictures. And these are real news articles and there are individuals who end up in wheelchairs or they pass away because they've taken a second hit and they've not returned to their baseline before they resume play. And so this is, so this is something that's very, very important. So there's some brochures up front that are the do's and don'ts of concussion. This is the big don't. If you're not back to normal, doesn't mean you can't exercise, it just means you should not be doing activities that put you at high risk for having another head injury or another concussion, okay? The other thing that, that gets a lot of media attention is the uh, concept of what we call chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is not a new thing for us in medicine. It's actually rather old. So back in 1928, we talked about something called pugilistic dementia. So pugilistic, boxing, dementia, demented, right? So what would happen is these boxers would take so many hits to their head that they would actually end up having early dementia. So if you think about someone like Muhammad Ali, he probably didn't actually have Parkinson's disease. He probably had so many hits to his head that he's disrupted his pathways, and so he has a Parkinsonianism, right? It looks like Parkinson's, but it's actually from head trauma. And so what we've known is, is that if you get many, many, many hits to the head, and it's not just boxing, it's professional football, and it's soccer, and it's hockey, and it's all these other sports, right, or activities that are high risk, if you don't allow adequate healing and if you don't space out those injuries and make sure that the patient is back to normal, then you get into trouble. Another really good study that recently came out about two years ago was actually in soccer, right? So in, in my female or male athletes who play soccer, one of the questions that I ask them is how many headers do you do in a practice and how many headers do you do in a game? And then we start doing the math. And if you start adding up, you'll find that many of these soccer players are actually doing over 1,000 headers per year. Now, they didn't get a concussion, but 1,000 or more headers per year, if I gave them neuropsych testing now, let them play the season, check them after they did 1,000 headers, their neuropsych test scores actually go down. So their memory, their reaction time, their speed actually goes down. So doing a header is not necessarily a bad thing, but again, it's that rapid, many hits back to back to back without adequate spacing in between to allow a recovery period. I mean, that's not, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that, right? So sometimes I'll say, hey, see that wooden door over there? Go bang your head against it to a thousand times. And they look at me funny and they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, see, it's, it's the same thing. You wouldn't do that. So, you know, you got to count your headers. You got to be a little bit careful with it. 
okay? So across the age, boys in general are just worse than girls. Maybe it's because they're impulsive or I don't know. But across, across the age range, we, we beat girls in head injury all the time. And a lot of these head injuries actually happen in adolescence and, and in, in young kids. And there's really good evidence that suggests that the younger you are, the longer it'll take for you to recover. So, so if you're a college athlete versus a high school athlete versus a middle school versus elementary, I'm much more conservative with a child in elementary school on how quickly I let them return to high-risk activities versus someone who's in high school or college. So the older you get in this case, you're actually more resilient. Usually it's the other way around, right? Kids break their ankle, they're like, ah, I'm good, let's go. In, for the brain, because of the way that the brain is developing, you actually want to be more cautious the younger the child is. Um, I don't, do you guys want to talk about neuropsych testing at all? Maybe show a hand? Yes, okay, fine. Okay, so, so I, I like to talk about neuropsych testing typically with the older kids. So we, we use a product called Impact at Chalk, um, not because it's better or worse than the other ones, but it does have a pediatric one that I can start testing kids as young as age five. And so what Impact looks at is it looks at a couple domains that are really, really sensitive to concussion. So it looks at like uh, verbal memory, visual memory, reaction time, and uh, visual processing speed. So those four domains, specifically the last two, how quickly you can do a task, are pretty sensitive for concussion. So many times, though, I'd like to have what we call a baseline test. So if the kid's participating in a high-risk sport, having a baseline that I can compare them to is actually really important. Because sometimes I get parents in there, and they're like, my kid's the honors gate, 4.6 GPA, and then they take the test and they're like 50th percentile, right? And that's not necessarily bad because normal is between the 25th and 75th percentile. Let me show you. I have a math lesson in here actually at some point. Here we go. So remember if you have a normal distribution curve, normal is actually in this bar, 25 to 75th percentile. So you can be an honors student and still be 50th percentile on this test. It doesn't matter to me because it's not an intelligence or test. It's just how you do on this performance measure. Um, and so having a baseline actually is really helpful. And I'll show you some examples about why that's helpful. But the challenge is, is that sometimes when they give the testing, they do it in situations like this. So you can imagine, I can't even move the mouse here. I got four guys. Everyone's moving. It's super loud. Right? So you get a really bad baseline, and so that's not so, so super helpful for me. So if we can do baselines in good settings and they're reliable, then I like them. If they're like this, I don't really want, know what to do, and there's some good studies, especially like in football or high-level athletes, sometimes they try and do what we call sandbag it, which is go really slow and do a bad performance so that when they get a concussion, if I test them, right, then it looks better than what they did before and then they're okay. So, so this is about honesty too. So, so part of what we do is trying to educate our kids. So if they recognize symptoms of concussion, headache, dizziness, light sensitivity, nausea, sleep disturbance, increased emotionality, confusion, difficulty processing, sounds a lot like depression, but it's all the concussion symptoms. It's the same ones. Um, so if they have these kind of symptoms, they need to recognize them and let you know, and you need to be aware as parents that you have every right to pull your child out of the sport, right? So if the kid gets hit in the head and you're kind of like, you know, my, my, my daughter or son looks off, they're not playing normally, they seem dizzy, you have every right to pull them off the field as a parent and just say, you know what, concussion, I, you know, take them out. It's way safer for you to do that and be the overbearing parent. That's okay. The coaches might not like it, but I do. Okay, so we won't torture you with math. There we go. Okay, so all of these things are the things that make patients have a prolonged recovery. One of the most common mistakes that parents do is they overuse NSAIDs, so that's Motrin, Tylenol, after you get a head injury. And what that actually does is sets up something called rebound headaches. So if you're using Motrin or Tylenol for your headaches, even if you're a parent and you're doing that, that's bad. You should stop that, okay? <laughs> because what you're doing is, is you're actually setting yourself up to convert your every once in a while migraine, for example, into what we call a chronic daily or a rebound medication overuse headache. And so you can use Motrin, you can use Tylenol to treat headaches, but if you're doing it more than three times, two times a week, it's a bad thing. You don't want to do that. The other things that kind of get, can, can cause problems is like, for example, if, if, 
if the physicians don't pick up on eye tracking problems. And so Dr. Miner, who was one of our sports med docs that actually has moved on to a, a different institution, we made some really nice videos to help with eye tracking, and it's on our website, which I'll give you again at the end. But uh, if you go to www.choc.org forward slash concussion, um, myself and the team, we've spent a lot of time putting a, a great deal of education on there. So if you're, oh my gosh, my child might have a concussion and I need to know something, that's the resource you should go to. It actually is almost as good as seeing me in clinic. Almost. Okay. So the other big mistake is actually excessive removal from, from activities. So what you want to do is, is basically you want to start with a brain rest activity. So chill out, pretend you're on vacation, limit your electronics. That doesn't mean they can't use anything, right? We don't have to be super crazy strict about it. We just want to be aware that if they're spending 12 hours on their phone after the concussion, or if they're going to Disneyland or taking a final, those are not good things to be doing after you get a head injury. And then physical activity, generally you want to kind of take it easy. That doesn't mean they can't do anything, right? They can walk around as long as it doesn't make them symptomatic. And then after about a day or two, you want to ramp up a little bit, and then you want to start thinking about how do we go to school. So we've worked and partnered with a lot of schools in the area to have some kind of return to school plan. I generally like the kids to maybe just try a half day first. Even if they feel really good, it's probably good to just do a half day the first day back to school, just in case. Or some kids can tolerate the full day, but a lot of them can't. So try a half day or a partial day, make sure they can tolerate it, and then you slowly ramp up. Once they kind of, and the other thing that was interesting is initially when the guidelines first came out, the, the experts, quote unquote, were like, no, you have to be completely back to normal academically before you can start doing physical activity. And in reality, that's actually not what you want to do. You want to make sure that they're going back to school or getting back to school, but starting some light activities a few days out is actually helpful. So physical activity helps actually clear, as long as they're not getting super symptomatic, um, and having a lot of symptoms like headache and dizziness, light exercise is actually very helpful for concussion recovery. Um, it also helps with sleep and things like that. For cognitive adjustments, um, I'll include this. This is all actually all on the Chalk website, but you do want to sometimes make accommodations both for cognitive as well as social-emotional things. So for example, a lot of my patients, after they get a concussion, they're much more irritable. And so if their little brother or little sister is annoying them, they're just a lot, a lot less tolerant of it. Um, they're t less tolerant to noises. Um, they're more annoyed with you as a parent. Um, you got to be a little bit careful because that's not really them. It's the concussion and that, you know, if you start arguing with someone and it just escalates, that's not going to be good. So have a little bit more tolerance or, or patience with those, those students. The other thing is, is that if you have a really high achieving student, which is the case I see often, they're actually very hyper aware of their deficits. So imagine if you're like, hey, I'm doing calculus, it's super easy for me, and then you get a concussion and it's like, ah, oh, this is just really hard. Your frustration level gets peaked very quickly. If you have a kid who's kind of like, eh, not really good at math, and then they get a concussion, and then they're just not really good at math, it, they don't really, they don't really recognize that there's that much of a difference, right? So sometimes, sometimes the kids that are really high achieving are the ones that actually have a much harder time with recovery. So I'm gonna skip through some of this stuff, but all of this is on the website. This is, this is what I kind of call the danger zone, right? So if you are super high performing academically, in a ton of extracurriculars, multiple sport athlete, and oh, by the way, your social and family life is a little bit hectic and crazy and chaotic, and you know, you get into sort of this danger zone. So sometimes what we do is we see kids who, yeah, they're having this prolonged concussion recovery, but guess what? You know, if they would have broke their leg or they would have got mono, it would have been the same reaction. And so even from personal experience, I moved from Michigan to here, that's actually really traumatic for my kids. They, were, they did not do well with that transition. Right, and so what you want to do is, in just in general as parents, what we want to do is provide our children with really good coping mechanisms and really good resiliency. So some of the ways that we try and do that is I actually like this, Dr. Romain kind of put this together, but there's actually these developmental assets that you can kind of generate. Now that doesn't mean you have to have all six of these, but you should probably look at each of these categories. So in a category of support, 
what do I have that I've given my child so that they feel supported? Again, they don't need all six, and maybe if you have all six, it's actually bad for them. But maybe pick one or two and make sure that you hit one or two of these areas. And I'll send this to you guys uh, in a PDF. Same thing, right? Empowerment. How do you feel empowered, right? If you, are, if, you're, if you are working and your employer doesn't empower you to make decisions, right, you're not going to be happy in your job, right? You have to have some autonomy. So how do you give kids the ability to feel like they have some empowerment in them? And that helps them with recovery as well. Boundaries and expectations are important, right? So um, I'll give you an example. I actually had a parent that had no boundaries for their child, and their child was actually setting the boundaries. I don't want to go back to this sport because all the kids that are doing this sport are actually taking drugs when we go and hang out, and I don't want to be around that. And the parent's like, whatever, just don't worry about it. But the kid actually recognized as a teenager, I don't want to be around that environment. And I was like, that's fine. I, I have no problem writing you a note that you can't do the sport. I can be the bad guy. You don't have to be the bad guy. And the parent doesn't need to be the bad guy. Um, so the conversation is what else is going on with that kid, right? So he was having all these concussion symptoms, but it actually turned out he was just getting a lot of peer pressure to use drugs and he didn't want to, and that, that's the boundary that he had to set for himself. Uh, and then the last one is constructive use of time, right? So idle minds or idle hands get into trouble or something like that is the, the, what they say. And then commitment to learning. Positive values, oh, there's a lot of these. I didn't realize I had that many. There's 40 of them. Social competencies, positive identity. So let me, I'm just gonna give you one last thing to kind of finish with, and again, I'll send that to you guys. Um, sometimes it's not a concussion. So this is Danielle, she's 15 years old. She had a concussion while playing water polo. She struck her head on the pool wall. So after a brief loss of consciousness, no amnesia, lots of dizziness, fatigue, she was managed in a sports medicine clinic. Again, not this multidisciplinary concept that we have, and they tried all these things to get her better. But then when I started asking questions, you know, she's like, you know, Dr. Chairman, I, you know, I've had fatigue and I've noticed like hair changes and my skin feels different and like all of these things. And oh, by the way, they were all happened before the concussion. So now you got a kid and you're going, well, is it concussion or is it something else? Well, lo and behold, I don't know if you guys know, but if anyone's a medical professional, those are all symptoms of actually thyroid dysfunction. And so we actually checked her thyroid because, by the way, everyone in our family has thyroid dysfunction. We actually found antithyroid antibodies, got her in with endocrine, and lo and behold, she was back to normal. So anytime there's a, so this is not a concussion. Anytime I have a patient or anytime there's something that's not really following a typical trajectory, right? So if your kid gets a head injury, they should probably recover in a couple weeks, maybe a month and a half. So if you're kind of going past that, something's not right. Either some, there's something wrong. That's when you say, okay, you know what, now we need to get into the concussion clinic and we need to figure out what's going on. But a lot of times what we're trying to do is empower pediatricians to know how to do this. We do a lot of education out in the community, both the parents and pediatricians. Again, we're a team when we're trying to do what's best for our children. So that's it.